Peter, we have you at this time. Yeah, we got you full screen now. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So let's let's get started. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, my organization. We're a leadership coaching, organizational change, culture and strategy, and ethics education uh, company. Founded in 2003. Our mission is in our name. We help leaders, employees, and teams to recognize, learn, practice, and keep sound priorities. Um, I've got a long history with turning technologies. It goes back to 2007. Uh, we own 900 physical devices. Um, we activate, actually we have 500 soft pads we're using right now. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as power users and we're, um, we really enjoy the technology and we use it a lot. It's a big differentiator in our delivery of our products and services. For any executive coaches or educators on board, I can tell you that uh, it really helps with utilizing the Socratic method and other techniques using this technology. So I'm going to demonstrate some of that today during our session. Now the concepts from this webinar called Prioritizing for Performance come from two books that will be coming out. Uh, the first one next year is called The Goodwill Leader. And then the second book, Priority Thinking, is an extension of the leadership book. Very different approach. You're catching the tail end of the Goodwill Leader model today, just introducing some of these concepts, but they show up in this second book called Priority Thinking. Okay, so our flow for the conversation today, we got a jam-packed 60 minutes, but if you have questions, Kevin will interrupt. Uh, we, we like to kind of do the give and go as we go through this. So um, we're going to do some initial polling, cover the nature of a priority and defining a priority. And then we'll get into the three types of priorities and four types of prioritizers. And at the end, if there's time, we'll do those questions. Now, uh, about, about 90 people took a webinar, uh, pre-webinar pre survey. So I'm just briefly going to show you that uh, there'll be a link to that webinar. And here I'm just going to, I'm going to just pull it up here for you briefly so you can see this. Okay. So there'll be a link to this survey for those of you. Can you see that on your screen, Kevin? Yeah, we sure do, Peter. Okay. So this um, this link for all those who took this, the, the uh, pre-event survey, all that data is going to be out there for you. I've taken some snippets from it, and I'll get the link to you. So just so you know, that webinar results are there, and you'll be able to slice the data on your own as we go through. Okay. Let's get started. First of all, what's the problem we're trying to solve when we're talking about this topic of prioritizing for performance? Well, first one is we all have too many choices. And the, the company I like to talk about that really understood this problem is Costco. For any of you who shop at Costco, you know that you really only get one choice, the best choice. They've determined what constitutes excellence in that particular product category and you get to choose. So big problem today, too many choices. Second, we have too little time. And um, this is a recent phenomena really in human history is that even though we're living longer, um, we're just trying to do more. And in many, many cases, we're just um, running out of time and unable to manage time the way we should. Then finally, and this is the one I come across in helping leaders to lead, is we get overwhelmed, we get confused. Um, it's really happened in the last uh, 120, 130 years. There's a very famous uh, uh, painting out there by Edvard Munch in 1893. He kind of captured the angst of modern people in making choices. So the, the painting's called The Scream. Uh, fascinating, um, you know, yeah, I still see it in walls of offices I come in where we're just kind of overwhelmed in the idea of just making choices. So th that's the problem that we're going to kind of poke at today as we get into this topic of priorities. Five important takeaways from today. And the first thing I want you to keep in mind is that all sound priorities increase and sustain performance. They do that at the lowest risk possible for that situation, and they embed natural ethical power. So keep that in mind as you go through the whole presentation today is 
If you're able to prioritize for performance, it's because you are setting sound priorities and they're going to have these three um, kind of qualities that should come out. Increase and sustained performance at the lowest risk with the greatest ethical or moral power. All right, so then your first takeaway. I'm going to give you some concepts about the nature and meaning of priorities. Second, the difference between three basic types of priorities, and that'll be tactical or day-to-day -day priorities. Second, strategic priorities. And then third, core priorities. And we'll talk about the ordering principles that drive those. I'm going to give you two tools. So we're going to kind of pause in the middle of that tactical or day-to-day -day priorities. I'm going to take you through two tools that uh, I uh, coach leaders on. There's many other tools out there. Um, and then we'll uh, move into um, uh, just ex introducing these strategic and core priorities so you know the difference. And then finally, um, there's going to be these four types of prioritizers I introduce you to. We're not going to have a lot of time today, so uh, Kevin is thinking about some additional webinars on these topics, but I'm going to introduce them. And those four primary types of prioritizers are the inverter, which is the most insidious type of prioritizer, the absolutist, who uh, puts the highest priority at the expense of all the lower priorities, the depleter, they kind of screw up everything and they, they don't keep um, uh, sound priorities. And then finally, the optimizer who understands how to set the highest priorities, but also attend to the lower priorities and finds the sweet, sweet spot in which to optimize um, choice making in that situation. And then finally, um, we're going to have a link for you to both the pre-event survey data, um, some articles I've written, as well as concepts and tools. And you'll find that out on prioritythinking.com under our program section. And uh, our director of IT is going to, Tim Kendrick's going to be loading those up after the survey, and they'll be available to you. All right, so let's get started with some polling. So if you've, if you've registered your devices, and we're going to do three uh, demographic questions to get started. So here, if you would, uh, choose your uh, biological sex. And you'll notice up here in the upper left-hand corner, the, the um, responses are coming in. And I set the, um, you can do this in turning technologies is you can set it to show the audience that the data is actually coming in. So when I go out and I'm working with uh, groups, I'll have, um, I'll do this so that they can have confidence that the data is actually coming in and that it's, um, you know, that it's anonymous. So this is a good technique if you're using the technology. So go ahead, everybody just press one or two at the bottom of your screen. You might have to scroll down if you're, um, if you've logged in, but you can't find the choice, it's it's nestled at the bottom. Hey, Peter, let, let me jump in if I could. This is always the part where people are, are wondering where we're responding, especially if they just joined recently here. So again, guys, you're able to participate within this polling session by opening up a separate browser and going to the URL, ttpoll.com. So that's T-T-P-O-L-L.com. The session ID is going to be priorities, priorities with an S. The other way you can go ahead and join the session is through the Turning Point app. If you have it on your iPhone or Android device, again, you open it up, put in the session ID priorities, and that's going to enable you to go ahead and answer this question. I know, Peter, you have a number of questions throughout, so the more people we get in, the better. So again, it's ttpoll.com, session ID priorities. Yeah, well, and we'll uh, wait a little bit here, and I'll just give a little bit more explanation. So when I'm using the technology, I have, I have up to 900 of the hard devices and 500 of the soft seats if you're using them right now. And so, for example, if I go into a factory or a large audience, um, I've done this as large as 600 people in the room. Um, but in factories where the employees might be concerned that their answers are not anonymous, I'll literally have them switch the devices. And then once, I'll, once I stop that, I'll say, okay, now you've got your device. We're going to capture the results. And it's really a lot of fun. It's real time. There's a lot of survey, surveying going on nowadays, and Turning Point really gives you the ability to do it live, which is much more engaging. Some of the educators on, the, on today's call probably know that, too, from their use of the technology. Okay, I'm going to close the polling here. Let's just wait uh, maybe a few seconds here to get over, uh, get over 90. There we go. So I'm going to close the polling. And uh, by the way, if you join, that's okay. You can participate. And I'm going to go up here, and you'll notice up at the 
upper left-hand column, I can tell you the number of folks too. So you see here we have 65 um, females or women on the call in 25 minutes. So there's there's that, and then you can go back up here and use that to split back. All right, next question. Which of the following best describes your role at your organization? You're a leader, manager, supervisor. Again, I'm showing it live right now. We're not gonna show it live for everything. Number two, you're an educator which uh, the educators know is a form of leadership because educators lead students to the truth, to discover reality. Or three, you're a professional or individual contributor. So just choose the role that is closest to your role in the organization. And again, if you're just joining us, don't worry, jump right in. We're just gonna show how the technology works. So there we go, we've got a bunch of other folks joining us. Okay, we'll let it go on for a second. And we're up to see if we could break 100 there. A few more folks. All right, if you want to join as we go, please jump in. I'm going to close the polling. And again, you can see that there's the numbers, there's the percentage. So we got a nice, healthy split. This will be fun for a little bit later when I'm going to introduce you to Slice. All right, now this is a new um, capability from Turning Technologies called a hotspot. So I loaded up the map. And if you would, just point on the screen where uh, you're located. And uh, the, um, you can see it's going to register it. And by the way, if you're coming in from Europe or Asia or Australia, just go ahead and press out here near the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. And if you're coming from Mexico, spent four years down there, loved it, um, go ahead and press somewhere down in here. So this was a big enough map I could find. All right, and we're up to about 86 responses there, 88. Okay, so it's kind of giving you a, it's a nice little density thing you can use. You can load up any diagram to do this. It's a lot of fun, and uh, we use it for uh, you know, a variety of methods. Okay, I'll close the polling. There we go. All right, so our demographics are done, or firmographics, depending on how you want to look at that. Now I'm gonna just show you briefly with some questions about priorities, how we can use that data to slice um, the results we get from you by those prior demographic questions we did. All right, so here's the first one. As you are watching and listening to this webinar today, at this very moment in time, what is the top priority you have? What's it related to? Okay, is it related to your family, work, physical well being, spiritual well being, financial health? Just pick something that's kind of your top priority at this moment in time uh, that you're thinking about. Okay, very good. We're over 90. Go ahead, everybody else in. We might break 100 here shortly. Okay, 98. 99, let's wait for 100 to join us. How about that? There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna close the polling. Under, oh, wow, we got a few more folks coming in. All right, so I'll close the polling. And not surprisingly, um, work came out first, followed by family, physical well-being, spiritual well-being, and then financial health. Now, I'm just gonna show you quickly, here's an example of the slicing tool. You can see this, this little bar pop up. I'm gonna put it right over, uh, let me put it over here. And let's just see what the ladies said versus the men. Okay, there, there's that slice. That's uh, the, the gentleman. So that's one example. I'm gonna clear that slicing. I'm gonna go in and just quickly, I'm gonna slice by the role. So here's the educators today. Okay, educators uh, went up on family and work and physical well-being there. Now I'm gonna slice it by the leaders. Wow, see the leaders? A lot of concerns about work here. And then the individual contributor, professionals here. Okay, then we saw some movement there. So the nice thing about the slicing tool is it allows you to kind of get into the um, tranches or, or um, subpopulations of the communities you're working with and see what they think. So. I also use this tool. I've taught at uh, Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, MIT Sloan, and a number of other regional programs. It's a lot of fun to get into the data, especially between international students 
and uh, US-based students and see their differences in views. Okay, let's go to the next question. The biggest challenge I have keeping my work priorities. Now just think about your work environment. Okay, what keeping those priorities straight is due to lack of what? Lack of talent, meaning qualified people to work with or, or that you need to fill out your team. Two, treasure, meaning resources, capital, investments, things like that. And then three, time. There's not enough hours in the day uh, to do all the work you need to do. So go ahead, choose. Obviously, it could be all three of those, but choose the one that's the biggest challenge for you. All right, I'm going to close the poll shortly here, so jump on in. All right, very good. Okay, not surprisingly, time was the, the biggest constraint for most folks. And of course, talent and um, resources are also a challenge. So again, I'll just do a quick split for you all to see the data. And we'll do this again. Let's just see what the leaders are struggling with. Okay, see how talent went up there for the leaders? So they're, I often come across leaders are trying to fill out the right people on their team. Let's go up and see what those educators had to say. Okay, for educators, time in the day. And for the professionals, individual contributors. So you can see some of the movement there. And I will have this data posted out there for you so you can, um, you can review this. All right. And then our uh, last question, and just doing this introduction, rate yourself on a scale of one to seven. How effective are you at keeping sound priorities? As you understand that term, sound priorities, okay? One is poor, all the way to seven is excellent. And if you think you're average, just choose four or around four on that scale of one to seven. Okay, I'm gonna close the polling shortly. Okay, and then in this particular slide, you notice how I inserted some attorney technologies stats tools. So here's the average, just above four, 4.65 right in here. And the median score, of course, you can see that is the five right there. Another quick slice, let's just see the ladies versus the gentlemen, how, how this one turned out. Okay, here's females. Okay, by the way, this will not change because uh, it's the aggregate, okay? And then let's just see with the men. So the men, we had a, definitely a higher group here in the five. And um, for the ladies here, uh, we saw a shift to the left. So that's, um, everybody see that shift that's going on there? I don't know if you can, you notice that. The men feel like they're more effective. Um, as my wife says, she's, that's because the, she's carrying more of the load. So um, just a reminder to us that it's a perspective as well, right? Okay. All right. So we've done those three example questions. Let's get into the, to, um, the first part of our presentation today, the nature of priorities. So we've done some polling. Now let's get into the nature of a priority. And then we'll define a priority right after that. Okay. So a lot of folks had perspectives on priorities. Uh, Gandhi viewed it not just as words, but action. And clearly he role modeled that in his life and his leadership. Uh, Maya Angelou, I, this woman has just got some brilliance. Um, I, I love this quote, I've uh, forgotten it at my peril, but never make someone a priority when all you are to them is an option. Um, this is a good one for leaders and followers to remember, not just in professional life, but friendships in general. Here's another one by, uh, Stephen Covey, who wrote uh, one of the best books on priorities, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, really had a nice style to him, but he identified the key as um, not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. So another great example. So these are just three of the wise souls in our history. And then here's one more, Joyce Meyer. Some of you might be fans of her. People often ask her um, how she keeps her priorities straight in life. And she tells them that it's done by constantly straightening them out, which I really like this quote because I find that even though my company's name is Priority Thinking, it is an ongoing daily challenge to keep your priorities straight. 
And I'm going to give I'm going to give you some of the insights into why that occurs as well. All right. So here's the first part I'd like you to think about when it comes to understanding um, the nature of priorities. The wise person knows the order of things. So if you want to be effective, you must keep a set of priorities. So all effective leaders keep priorities. Now in our book, The Goodwill Leader, we identify three um, major groups of leaders. The goodwill leader, and that's the leader that's trying to do the good and is both effective and ethical. The weak-willed leader, which is um, not being as effective as they need to be, nor as ethical as they need to be. And then finally, the bad will leader, who is highly effective, but highly unethical. So remember, the ability to set sound priorities means that you're being effective and ethical. And there's two challenges that occur. In the professional world, we're dealing with the topic of results. And in our personal lives, we're dealing with relationships. So this is invariably going to create tension for us. So wisdom comes to the person who can keep those straight and be both effective and ethical or moral in their life. And the the key is finding those optimal points, those kind of sweet spots where we're making the right choice in the situation. All right, so keep that in mind as we go through. All right, so priorities require uh, a kind of um, unity, if you will, if we're going to understand how they work. So the first thing is, if we have a priority, it means that we're trying to order things. And if we're trying to order things, it means we're trying to bring unity or wholeness to something. So whenever you think of the word priority, within its very nature, it has an ordering aspect to it. And that ordering should be towards some type of wholeness or unity of a given thing. Now, three kind of qualities make up the nature of a priority. You have limited time, two or more things or goods, and a choice has to be made. So that, that's what I'd like you to keep in mind as far as the uh, nature of a priority at stake. Now, what is a choice? That's really what priorities are going to come down to. So first thing is, it's an act of reasoning. It means we're thinking, okay? We're not just reacting. Although if we're reacting, hopefully it's the product of habits that have been formed as a result of making or thinking about good choices. Okay, second, it consists of in comparing real possibilities. It's not something abstract. A priority is dealing with real choices or real goods in front of you, and you have to choose among those goods or possibilities. Third, it, the choice ends when you determine or decide one good is better than another. And if it's the right choice, the better good is going to be pursued, and the other goods are not going to be. Now, Aristotle tells, tells us that the will is the choice power within our, within our being. So uh, when you see somebody with a strong will, that means that they have a sense of uh, their choice, or frankly, they could be very stubborn, right? But will is that choice power. And what Aristotle said is that our will is always aiming for a good. Even when we choose evil, we're really just choosing a good that is defective or lacking its full being, okay? So um, our will is always aiming for a good. So when you tell one of your friends or colleagues you don't have your priorities straight, you're seeing that he or she has screwed up the goods that they should have better ordered in their life. Now, um, there's a great theologian in the Middle Ages called St. Thomas Aquinas who said, and he was, a, he was one of the finest students of Aristotle, he said that the will never aims at evil or these defective goods without an error existing in the reasoning process of the person making the choice. So a good education is one that is teaching people how to think clearly, how to understand the goods before them and choose correctly. So I know with many of the um, uh, CEOs and executives I work with, they're frustrated because they have people they don't think should be are thinking at the level that their degrees suggest they should. And if you're an educator, of course, you understand how difficult it is um, to do this if the if the kids aren't coming from good ham family environments and other things like that. Because education begins in the home, 
not just done at schools throughout life. So uh, keep that in mind. This is a really important part of understanding uh, priorities is what the cho nature of choice is. Okay, now let's define priorities or what a priority is. So the word priority, it has um, really comes from the 14th century. And the, the part I'd like to highlight, and this will again be on the recording for you, is that in the 14th century, they tended to focus in on a priority as um, the order of time, how we, how things came into order, ordering. Um, and uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really viewed as what was important or requiring immediate attention. And that was how the definition kind of um, emerged. But by the uh, middle of the 20th to the late 20th century, uh, it be became a verb. So you might recall uh, Google, for example, was a noun, and then we turned it into a verb by saying, would you Google that? Or Xerox, um, we, we would say Xerox that copy. Now you'll notice that that verb is no longer used actively because there's plenty of copiers from plenty of brands out there. So um, the word kind of uh, to prioritize is still within our vocabulary, but kind of an interesting thing happened along the way. If you look at the usage of the verb, if you go out to Google, you'll see it kind of peaked in this period of time. And a little later in the presentation, I'm gonna introduce you to uh, President Eisenhower's uh, uh, little matrix that he had for uh, making decisions. But I think it prioritized as well because of Stephen Covey's um, book that sold over 30 million copies called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, but then it began to decline. And part of the reasons I believe it began to decline was we became overwhelmed. So it's one of those things where it almost became a bit of an undiscussable. So uh, I find that when I'm coaching executives, um, they struggle when, when their boss might say to them, let's sit down and discuss your priorities. It almost has a negative connotation to it. And um, I think that's because, you know, that, that painting, the screen, kind of depicts how these choices make us feel. We, we can feel overwhelmed. But there's another phenomenon, which I think is the emergence of values talk. Values are indeterminate. And uh, as a result, they don't require us to choose like a priority does, at least in the way we talk about it. So that might be some of the reason that we're experiencing this decline in the, the use of the word is everything feels like a priority nowadays and therefore nothing becomes a priority. Okay, so here are some of the definitions you gave on your pre-event survey. I thought these were some of the ones I took off the list. Uh, first one, what you, what you have to get done first. That's very good. What is important and needs completion no matter what. So that one, you know, put uh, the em emphasis on importance. Things that are done that are necessary to free time to innovate. So clearly an entrepreneur or, a, or an inventor there. Tasks that have a hierarchy of necessity. This is a really great insight, whoever wrote this. Um, all priorities exist within a hierarchy um, because we're ordering. So um, whoever, whoever wrote this really had a great insight here. A choice, we just covered that, very good. A weighting of importance or a weighted importance. And then a most effective use of time between competing tests. So all these were good ones I thought we should review. Here's the definition I'd like you to um, take away from today. A priority is a choice, a required choice. And it's between two or more competing goods given limited time. And the definition, a priority establishes an order of importance or sequence for a person's or group's actions. So you're choosing an action or an activity. And in this sense, I want you to think about that we don't really choose money per se. We're choosing the action by which we use money. That's an example. All right, now I've used this word good, and I'd like to delve in into it a little bit more because we've covered the importance of choice and of time. We really haven't covered this, this other um, quality of a priority, uh, what is good. So the way I try to explain the nature of the good is we usually use it as a uh, adjective. Hey, that was a good movie, or uh, he did a good job, or whatever. But I'd like you to think of what is good as anything that leads to or completes the whole of something according to its nature. So 
So think of it as leading towards wholeness or that unity that I talked about early on, right? Priority, order, unity. Second way to think about the good, something that fulfills a human need, okay? Third, anything we desire and out to desire. And there's a natural hierarchy of goods that exist. We have day-to-day, -day, you know, economic material needs. Then we have living healthy, physical and spiritual well-being. And then up here, the highest goods are these kind of moral goods of um, living excellently, living, um, you know, li living with excellence. Okay. So those are way I'd like you to think about the good. And here are some of your responses from the um, pre-event survey. Some of the questions I asked. Um, perfect is the enemy of good. If you can see it right here, this first question. Okay. And um, about, uh, let's see here, it came out to about 68% of you agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that perfect is the enemy of the good. Of course, we didn't give you a middle choice. Um, and then 30% of you disagreed. I would tell you that the majority got this right. This comes from a French quote. And if you're per pursuing perfection and don't know when good is good enough, You'll, um, you'll end up procrastinating or spending too much time and, and being late. And there's some famous procrast um, perfectionists in human history. Um, Plato was one of them, for example. Um, but uh, you can go throughout history and find folks that fought their perfectionism in order to get things done. And there's a lot of painters that will tell you that they, they never finish a painting. They simply abandon it. So um, keep that in mind. This, um, this harms leaders. Leaders cannot be perfectionists. They'll drive their people crazy, and they'll, um, frankly, not get things done. This quote, good is the enemy of great, comes from um, Jim Collins in the opening page of his book, Good to Great, by the same name. Um, and uh, I, about 55%, 56% of you agreed with that. 43% um, uh, of you disagreed. Um, I have a separate thing on ethics I do where I actually challenge this, that um, Collins really got this wrong. And um, I have an article called The Moral Fox in which I, I explain how he put good in opposition to greatness and created a proxy for greed. So um, another time we can go over that. Um, but keep in mind, okay, good is never the enemy of the great. It's actually the foundation upon which greatness occurs. And of course, Collins probably intended that, but is his verbiage actually led to excess. Um, a person is still good even if they do bad things. And this was a strongly agree, um, 80% right over here. But I would tell you that uh, I'd ask you all to reconsider this. Yes, they're good in the sense that all human beings have goodness within them. But probably one of the modern fallacies we have is our conduct, not our intentions, determines our character. So as you go through and you think about that word good, Think about the fact that there is a threshold upon which we're a good leader, a good educator, a good contributor. And uh, no matter what we do, um, we may have goodness within us, but it's being buried and corrupted if we don't um, start making good choices. So another thought for you. Of course, there's no good deed goes unpunished. Um, uh, folks disagree. There's usually a split on this, but this usually has to do with you're trying to do good and the person resents it. And then people should do good for its own sake. We had a very strong response there, um, and that's that's the healthy answer for for folks who are trying to you know do good in society. We had, I think we had 93 percent there. So a quick review of your answers there. Okay, so we'll wrap up with this thought here. Okay, the challenge when we're using the word good is: are we choosing a true good over a false good, a real good over an apparent good, an authentic good over a fake good? and a greater good over a lesser good. All this is going to affect whether you have sound priorities. That spectrum of goodness is what uh, you're going to be challenged uh, to make good judgments on. All right, now we're, let's move into three kinds of priorities. It's going to probably take more than 10 minutes on this one. And uh, Kevin, if you get any questions that we get in this area, I'll pause, okay? So first, three priorities I'd like you to keep in mind. Day-to-day, -day, tactical, and this is where I'm going to introduce some of the tools, strategic priorities, and then core priorities. A strategic priority is, um, is a topic I'll just give you some introduction to, and then we'll spend more time on core priorities. 
And uh, I'm going to introduce Eisenhower's um, uh, Eisenhower's uh, decision matrix here. So we're talking about tactical or day-to-day -day priorities. Um, Stephen Covey popularized President Eisenhower's concept here, which was where you focus your time both on urgent activities versus the important ones. So many of you on the call have probably seen this before. It's a great tool to, um, to take out again and again and remind yourself about. I've got a little article we'll be posting on the website for you. But the idea is that the, this upper right block Block where it's urgent and important. These are this is where you're trying to focus first. Second, you're trying to focus in on the important but not urgent tasks. And then three, get down here to the urgent but not important. And then finally, jettison these tasks that are not important or not urgent. And what I find most folks, um, the real secret to this matrix is right down here, folks. See this number four collapse where where President Eisenhower says jettison this task, right? Too many of us leave the junk on our calendar or in our life. We don't clean out and jettison these activities that are just waste time wasters. So it's a great tool. It'll help you with your day-to-day -day priorities. Okay, let's go to the next. This is um, this is how you all answered on the pre-event survey, um, the stack ranking of um, who's setting your priorities at work, um, primarily day-to-day, -day, of course, but your boss or leader or superior. That came out number one. Then um, not too far behind uh, in the waiting um, was yourself. Breathing down your neck, though, were those customers. So clearly um, a lot of you are engaged with um, students or clients or customers. And then finally down here, your, your employees. So the, the interesting thing about this, though, is really when we're, especially if you're in business, the organization, um, it's going to have, find a lot of tension or, or conflict going on here. And uh, it's good to be looking at who is driving the train, what's causing us to set our priorities. And I'll tell you whether you're reacting or acting. All right. And now this is an article that will be out on the uh, Priority Thinking website for you. It's at the end of the uh, survey for those of you who took it. So there are about 600 folks who signed up, about 90 or so took the survey. Um, so if you go to PriorityThinking.com, this article on learning how to set priorities is there. And there's four key points in it. Do you know how much time you have available? Um, do you allow yourself not to be distracted? Do you understand the nature of your organization? So a lot of prioritizing problems come from people that don't understand the nature of the thing they're involved in. And so they're, they're making choices about uh, competing goods that are not even in the same basket of goods. So this is really important. It's a kind of little secret sauce of sound prioritizing is understanding what makes your organization uh, tick and talk, as we'll speak. And then all priorities, we have to acknowledge that there are limits. So I'm going to talk about that in, um, in uh, the upcoming tools. So here's the first technique for setting um, priorities for the day. And this is a day-to-day -day tool. And um, what I encourage folks to do is write out or type out. I prefer writing. Um, there's a lot of neuroscience that says that if you use your handwriting, it, um, it'll connect to your memory much better than typing. But um, write out the list of things you have to do. Okay, don't worry about the order right now. And then put the following code in front of each activity. So you have to make a phone call, a text, you have to write someone, see somebody, do something, or read and reflect. Now, I don't tend to um, use the R code very often. Some of my clients do, and I don't tend to use the T. I tend to just react to text, and uh, periodically I, I'll send them. But um, I'll tend to use, in my priority listing, a P, S, D, and W much more frequently. Then allocate your time into blocks of these activities. So then what I'll end up doing is I'll, um, I'll take my handwritten list, and then when I'm looking at my Monday to do, I'll put those um, uh, phone tasks or write tasks where I, because I'm an early bird, I'm usually up around 5, 5.30, is I'll, I'll get my writing tasks out of the way early in the morning. Beginning of the day, I'll try to make my phone calls to move those things. And then the do and the, and the see tasks, which usually take longer, will follow. So um, that's, this is a way of kind of grouping and ordering. And remember, for those of you, and especially uh, emerging leaders, uh, and students is writing, uh, handwriting is a 
very important way to um, help your uh, memory. Okay, now the next technique is called the red line and the reorder technique. Now this is the one you can use with your colleagues and with especially with your superiors or team leader. You write down um, the order and due date for each of the products or deliverables that you believe need to be done. And so um, when my team does this with me or when I did it with uh, my bosses as I climbed the food chain all the way up to CEO was, hey, list out everything that needs to be done and then I would go into my boss and I would say, okay, here are my priorities. Here's what I've listed. And look at, here's the red line. This is what I think I can get done. And I'm, I'm maxed out. I don't think I can get to these. Now, success in this technique is um, showing your boss or your colleagues, <coughs> excuse me, that you have not forgotten what you've been asked to do. This is really super critical. Okay. So keep that in mind. Um, they'll trust you if they believe you're remembering everything. So when you do draw the line, then you can begin to help get their help in helping you to reorder this. Now, um, this technique though has its challenges. So let me um, let me move quickly to the next one. Here's the warning. I show up in my boss's office with this list, but my boss's view of the priorities are over here. He thinks I should be able to do one through nine, and he's got 10, 11, and 12. So what I encourage folks to do is don't go in and be defensive. You got to list these out. The key here is full disclosure, okay? not hiding things or hoping your boss will forget. It requires a very ask assertive full disclosure approach. And then what I found as I worked my way up the food chain was my boss was usually right. There were usually ways I could get things done so long as he trusted that I was giving it my best effort. And but avoid that kind of manipulative mindset that can set in where, um, where you're trying to get the boss to do the priorities you want versus the needs of the business. It really requires kind of an open-mindedness, which frankly is a form of humility and avoids black and white, all or nothing thinking, okay? All right, so those are just two techniques. I'll have those posted out on the site for you. Let's take though a, um, an example though, these are day-to-day -day priorities. Let's switch over to strategic priorities and let's take a situation going on right here in the US today, right? And it involves who should be prioritized first in receiving the vaccine against COVID-19. So take out your, um, or press on your screen, who do you believe? Now all three of these groups, okay, are, are goods, if you will, go, uh, groups of good people that need the vaccine, but who should be prioritized first? So this is an example of a strategic priority that I'm sure the, um, the administration, uh, I, whichever administration is running this, let's say for right now, obviously it's President Trump and his team, okay? Who do you believe should be prioritized first in receiving this vaccine? So go ahead, we're up to 81. And let's see if we can get up into the 90s maybe. All right, it looks like we're slowing down a bit. I'm gonna close the polling shortly. All right, so you can see here medical, sorry, that thing shifted a little bit, but medical providers was 72%. Uh, second came in was vulnerable or at risk. And then the last one was transmitters. So this was based on all of us living with COVID here. This was your view. Uh, the New York Times just had a fascinating article out today that the priority should actually go to the transmitters. Um, so uh, anyway, some food for thought here is that as we're setting strategic priorities, it's kind of interesting how we look at the cause and effect or sequencing of things to stop the spread of this deadly disease. All right, so here's an example. Um, uh, I like Dave Ramsey, um, um, several of uh, my colleagues and uh, folks on my team uh, follow him. Dave Ramsey is a master of setting priorities, and he has a strategic priority framework that he helps his followers uh, to use to get debt, um, debt reduction or debt elimination. So he calls this the debt snowball, and this is his strategy, his debt reduction strategy that he teaches. You can go right out to his website, and he talks about step one, to list out those debts, just like I was showing you, basic tools. Step two, make minimum payments on all debts except the smallest. So Dave's method is eliminate those small ones first, get the psychology of victory going, 
And then once the you work your way up from smallest to biggest, it's really kind of a fascinating psychology, very simple. And you'll notice how we go back to that kind of opening problem statement, which is we have too many, um, you know, we have too many um, choices nowadays. So Dave is eliminating those choices of being overwhelmed and simplifying and focusing in on, on the right depth. Okay, here's an example from one of my clients. Um, I, I copied in um, this example to show you that setting strategic priorities in the organization is not something you can just immediately do. It requires a number of activities. This particular client of mine, we're working through um, a scan of the environmental, you know, the space. Um, we have already set the vision or aim. We've got the value prop, which in uh, all good strategies, value proposition is key focal point of strategy. Building a financial model, talent model, et cetera. And then number seven is finally when we've set those strategic priorities after input from the team, et cetera, et cetera. So setting your organization's strategic priorities is going to take several steps. And the person who's setting those priorities is going to be the leader, okay? Uh, even though there'll be input from everybody, ultimately the leader's got to decide what are the strategic priorities. Okay, now we're going to go to the third set of priorities called core priorities. Now, we talked about day-to-day -day priorities, and we saw that uh, in your case, it was your boss was setting your priorities, then yourself, then customers who are very close right, close right behind you. In most organizations, you'll find that setting those daily priorities, um, if you really look at them, they're being set by others and you're, you're uh, responding and engaging because you're part of a whole team, okay? Strategic priorities are set by the leader, but a core priority is a very, um, it's kind of universal to the human family in that it is not set by your boss, it's not set by others, it's actually set by reality, by truth. And anyone with common sense, and all common sense means is that we are using all of our senses to engage reality and grasp what is a true good over a false good um, and a real good over an apparent good, um, an authentic good over a fake good and a greater good over a lesser good. So we don't need to have a PhD in psychology to figure this out, okay? Now let's see, let's take a quick example here and I'll show you what I mean by that, all right? Both priorities are important. Which should a parent give the higher priority in the rearing of his or her children? Effort or results? Now remember, both are important, but which should a parent give the higher priority in the rearing of his or her children? So go ahead, choose one or two. One for effort, two for results. Again, both are important, but one has to be the higher power. All right, I'm gonna close the polling here shortly, and we'll do a quick slice on this too. Okay, let's close. And two to one, effort over results occurred. Now, let's just do a quick split. And I'm just gonna to go to the top here and we'll see what, what men chose. Okay, still two to one, so we're probably not gonna see much with, with the women. Yep, about the same. All right, so um, let me reset that. There we go. So I've done this poll probably, um, I've probably got over 20,000 responses and it's always come out in the um, um, two to one, three to one ratio of effort over results. And of course, in the rearing of children, um, that would um, that would be the right uh, the right view to have. Um, now let's um, let's see how this. Uh, here I'm going to just show you another part of the turning technologies where you can actually um, have a slide come up where it takes effort and results. And this one I sliced by leader, educator, and professionals. And isn't this kind of an interesting split here? Do you see how? Um, this, this is just coincidence, but it usually happens is the, um, the professionals, the individual contributors, put effort um, over in rearing children much higher than results. Educators were that two to one ratio. And then look at the leaders here, uh, 55 to 45, uh, almost 50-50, but still um, put uh, effort over results. And that kind of shows you the subpopulation dynamics you can do with turning technology. So, uh, kind of fun and very interesting. All right. Um, of course, this this is where leaders get in trouble. Is um, you know, 
they go home and they treat their kids like employees. So uh, something to keep in mind, leaders, is uh, we have to be able to differentiate the groups we're working with, and this is a big challenge. Um, uh, the highly differentiated personality understands the nature of the person they're leading or dealing with, and it, it, it can, be a, can be a challenge for all of us. Okay, so I'm going to take that little example of a core priority now, though, and we're going to apply it to these four types of prioritizers that I'm going to introduce you to. Okay, so the four types of prioritizers are the inverter. The inverter puts a lower priority over a higher priority. The absolutist puts a higher priority at the expense of a lower priority. The depleter fails to act on either priority or either choice correctly. And the optimizer knows and acts on all the priorities, but when forced to choose, chooses the higher priority over the lower priority. Okay, so, uh, Let's go back to that parent prioritizers in rearing a child. Well, the inverter is gonna put results over effort in the rearing of a child. Now, when I was a young dad, um, my firstborn, uh, my son, um, I found myself wanting to see him, um, you know, when you're a young dad, I was projecting and wanting him to progress at a faster rate than he was able. Um, so uh, by the time I got to uh, my younger children, the kids thought I'd all got, became a real softy and was uh, too accommodating. So uh, my son ended up a Marine in the Marine Corps, a uh, tough guy, very, a great dad, better than, better than me. But um, I felt like when I was a young dad, I was inverting. I was putting maybe results over effort too much um, in rearing him. And then I softened up and got my act together and put effort over results um, going forward. The absolutist parent um, would put effort at the expense of results. This child, or I'm sorry, this parent would uh, believe that every child should get a, a trophy even when they're 14, 15, and 16 years old. In other words, they're putting that highest priority at the expense of those lower ones. They're not letting results create friction and, um, and cause the child to discover their true talents. The depleter parent, well, they're neglecting the child. They're neglecting to give them both effort and, re and focus in on the results. Uh, you know, we tend to call uh, Child Protective Services on those uh, those parents. What we're all trying to be, uh, whether as parents or grandparents, is we're focusing in on the effort that the child gives and the results, but when forced to choose, we choose effort over results in the rearing of the child. All right, now, here's another core priority set that came out in the pre-event survey. It was very close, so I'm posting an article out on the website for you called The Priorities of Getting It Right and Getting Along. You'll find it out there. It's about a five, six page article that'll go into more detail. But this close proximity was um, suggests that uh, this should be explored further. So when you read that article, I think it'll give you some greater insight. Because I know uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour. So this little diagram you'll see in the article that'll be on the website for you called The Priorities of Getting It Right and Getting Along. But I want to talk to you a little bit about these four types of prioritizers so you can see that none of us is operating in a static place. All priorities come down to choice. So um, I came up with this framework back in um, 1996 when I was a plant manager uh, down in Mexico, came, um, came home from a hard day of work, feeling like I uh, was being an optimizer, you know, um, knew all the priorities, was focused on them. Um, the kids were acting up. I was tired. My wife said to me, you deal with the kids. So I invoked order. I was an absolutist. I, I yelled at the kids, uh, told them to listen to their mom. Then I felt guilty. I apologized for yelling and tried to make it up to them, uh, giving in to the kids whatever they wanted. And um, I, at that moment, I became an inverter to my wife. Um, she got upset at me and um, for not supporting um, supporting her. And so then I said, the heck with it. So what's the point of these four types of prioritizers is under stress, you can be functioning here and you can go into this kind of Z pattern rather quickly. So as you um, think about those four types of prioritizers, those, um, those all come down to the choice you're making in the situation with the right judgment. Okay, so just to wrap up, what did we cover today? Well, we did some polling. I covered the nature of a priority and defining it. Introduced you to those three kinds of priorities, the day-to-day, -day, strategic, core priority. And here at the end, we applied that core priority, just the example of effort and results to those four types of prioritizers, which is the inverter, 
the absolutist, the depleter, and the optimizer. All right, so go ahead and rate today's session, and then Kevin, if there's any questions that you'd like me to talk about in the two minutes that remain, we can do that. Yeah, Peter, if you don't mind, uh, you know, as long as you don't have a hard stop right here at the top of the hour, there are some questions that I'd like to go ahead and make sure that we at least get on the recording here. Uh, and, and Peter, you know, not surprising, I've got a number of people asking when the next follow-up session is. A lot of great feedback here. People really enjoying the session. So uh, for folks that had that question, we're going to look for January to go ahead and get a follow-up session to this on the calendar. So be looking out for that. I will personally make sure everybody on this webinar gets a uh, extended invitation directly from me so we can get you registered for the next session. But Peter, let me get right to it. This goes back to right to the beginning of your webinar where you talk about a bad will leader. And the question is, do they typically last long? And if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here, Peter, but a bad will leader is, is they're not a very nice person, but they're kind of an effective leader. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, well, of course, we know about the monsters in human history that were bad will leaders, whether it's Pol Pot, Hitler, um, you know, any of the, any of the Stalin, et cetera. But, you know, the, uh, I mean, when I was a young soldier, um, you know, one of the, this is many decades ago now, but, you know, the concept of toxic leaders uh, existed in the military. I know it's still a challenge um, in certain spots because of the incentive system. But I think what you'll find is bad will leaders last longer than we would expect because they are effective. And what happens is those inversions kick in where we turn a blind eye towards their misconduct. And uh, because they're getting the result, even the wrong way, we tolerate that bad will until a strong goodwill leader comes along. And in the book, I actually talk about this, this nature of um, leadership today is this is what values talk is done. You see, the bad will leader has a set of values, um, and he or she is leading and practicing with those values. So um, that's why the nature of the good is very important. You have to understand the nature of the good, or else you'll um, you'll look at the bad will leader and just say, well, they're just they're being moral because they're practicing their values. Um, so that's a short answer. Now, in an upcoming uh, webinar, we not only can cover that, but I can expose you to. Um, operational excellence priorities that you can apply right on the front line of your business or uh, educational institution, all sorts of other kind of priority sequences that fall into that core priorities area. So whatever you choose, Kevin, we can, we've got plenty of content we could uh, introduce to your listeners and, and turning technology users. Well, I find myself an equal participant as I am a moderator on these things, Peter. So I know I'm looking forward to it and again, a lot of great feedback for people that have to exit. But a few more questions I want to make sure, again, that we have uh, on the session recording. Um, talk about prioritization. I'm kind of paraphrasing this question a little bit. Does it make sense at the beginning of each day that you should be prioritizing the highest mentally challenging task? Is that an a, a, appropriate approach when it comes to priority? Yeah, there's some, there's some folks that are advocates of, you know, do the highest challenging one first because your mental acuity is up. Um, I, I find that that works for a subgroup of the population. Um, uh, I found younger, when I was a younger leader, I, uh, one of my, my faults was I was too decisive. And so, um, I, my coach, uh, taught me how to deliberate more, especially as I climbed up to CEO. So it, some, you know, some, uh, some choices, you have to decide, do you have more time than you realize you have to make that choice? And enough, it's, it's really going to come down to judgment. There's really um, developing judgment is really hard. Most of us learn good judgment by making mistakes, exercising bad judgment. I would tell you, you got to do what works for you. For me, I like to get a lot of those little tasks out of the way first, and it clears my head to focus in on the big tasks. So I'm kind of a, if you look at what Dave Ramsey does in his approach too, is he's clearing the deck so you can focus in on one or two debt problems versus 15. That technique works for me. Other people, it might work to uh, focus in on the most challenging task of the day. Yeah, it's interesting, Peter. That actually is what I do personally. So I get the small stuff out of the way first so I can clear the way for the more challenging things. But uh, I find those small things can add up in terms of your time and monopolizing your time. So you have all those little small tasks, the next thing you know, it's taking two or three hours. So 
Um, likewise, I like to go ahead and shovel those things out of the way first. Pete, let's, let's get yeah, to the one, next question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, one more, one more thing real quick, Kevin. There is a thing um, uh, that all of you should keep in mind, though. There are core priorities each day that should be done first, and they're not little things. And so, for example, people who are in good physical condition will tell you that most of them will work out first and get that workout out of the way, even if they don't feel like doing it because it's an important priority in their overall well-being. So in another uh, webinar, I'll talk about these core priorities and we'll unpack them in much more detail and how they apply along kind of, con you know, in a very concrete, practical way. So today, kind of think of it as opening up a framework of prioritizing. So go ahead. Very good. Looking forward to that, Peter, for sure. So the next question that we had was, can you give an example of something that is urgent, but it may not necessarily be important? Well, my wife can give you a lot of examples of where, <laughs> I, where I thought she wanted, she wanted something that was urgent, but she felt it was important. Um, you know, I think um, here's how I would answer that is, it, the, the difference between an urgent and important priority is the difference between a want and a need. Um, I see a lot of leaders who want something done now simply because they're invoking their power to want that thing now versus um, identifying when do they need it. And so uh, for leaders, I often say, you know, if, if you're doing that because you feel like your subordinates aren't responding to you, there's a deeper dynamic or a deeper problem going on. So that would be an example of, of, I see this in organizational dynamics where the leaders are addicted to urgency. Uh, they want things now, they want things done now. Not everything has to be done now. Some things need to be deliberated on. Some things need fermenting. Um, and uh, I think our culture has kind of led to this urgency, this addiction to urgency that is, um, it's harmful because we don't stop and really do deeper thinking about what we're doing and the second and third order effects of those decisions. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Peter, for sure. Peter, two more questions here. The, the next one is, and it had to do with when you have kind of the red line with the priority. And the question at that time was, how about writing out like to-do lists at the end of every day? So actually like having a to-do list for the next day, do you find that being an effective method or is there a better way to handle the task list for the upcoming day or upcoming week? Yeah, I, so um, the reason I do the hand list is even though I'm a, a kind of a big IT guy and um, believe in agile methods and all that is there's a connection between the list and your memory. Um, you can't always have that list in front of you. So I believe that Really, if you're going to keep sound priorities, you have to develop the habit of being able to remember what is most important over some of those urgent things. So that's the deeper connection is writing it out. Now, in, um, whether you do it in the evening or in the morning is less important than the fact that you're cultivating your memory so that when you're in the car or in a meeting, you're not constantly having to go back to the list. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's how I, I like to think about it. Yeah, you got the core, right? You have those core priorities that you always have to keep in mind. And, um, you know, that, that always has to be at the forefront. And, I, I, you know, Pete, you tell me if, if it's the right thing, but I have core priorities that I'm writing down. And then below those core priorities, I kind of have tasks that need to be done within those. But the core priorities for me remain, remain relatively con constant. And maybe that's because that uh, with my job, a lot of it's project based because we put together trainings and videos and stuff like that. So it's very concrete what needs to be done uh, on those things. But, uh, you know, I have those core that relatively remain the same based on what the responsibilities are. But then there's subtasks that goes with those, which are fluid sometimes. Yeah, in fact, here's what I tell folks is that the core priority, what, what makes them so stable and so common to all of humanity. And I've I've done this training and uh, like I was over in China in, in late January teaching this in uh, factories over there and working with um, some of my client teams is core priorities do not change across time and culture. So, um, so for example, uh, if we do another webinar on operational excellence priorities 
or um, we take, for example, take that uh, priority set we did on effort over results. I'll give you a short story for your for those folks still listening. When I was teaching at Duke University, I would use that question in front of the students. And we had about, there were about 400 plus students in the room at a given time, and we split them up into three groups. And in one particular group, I asked that question, um, effort um, versus results in the rearing of children. And the answers came out 60-40. So one of the students, um, and these are all top tiers. Um, frankly, they, they, were, they were professional students, right? They'd all been accomplished. One of them said, hey, slice that by international versus US. And the, the, the male student who asked the question was kind of impishly implying that the international students would put results over effort. Well, guess what? They actually put effort much greater over results, which if you look at Asian culture, especially in Korea and some of the other cultures, the child is, um, you know, the way they rear their children um, they're able to get better results out of them later because they focus in on the effort at first. Well, anyway, the U.S. students came out almost 50-50. In fact, I think there was an inversion in the room. Young lady stood up, very polished. She was about 30 years old, very attractive, polished, wearing a skirt below her knee, um, turned to her students, so another 150 students in the room, tears welling up in her eyes. And she said, when I was growing up, my father gave me $1,000 for every A I got on the report card. And what, you know, what the wound that was coming out at the time was that she was being monetized, that her value was not in the effort she was giving, but the results she was getting. So these core priorities, you know, in another session, we can go into kind of the deeper roots of them, is they're grounded in our, in our psyche. They're grounded in our soul. We feel valued and we are valued based on how we treat others. Now, in the business world, we know that flips results over effort, but doesn't mean that effort doesn't count. So a boss who says to me, I don't care what, how hard you tried, it's the result that counts. Well, they turn out to be absolutists on the results side, and they turn everybody into a, a, a widget. So these core priorities, which we only glanced into today, but we could cover in a we could really fill up, I, I usually run full day sessions on this stuff, um, are a fascinating topic because if you get that core priority foundation straight, it's easier to do your strategic priorities and it's easier to do your day-to-day -day priorities. Peter, fantastic and very good. And I tell you, I think next time around, we have to put at least 90 minutes on the calendar to, uh, to, to make sure that we're not rushing you too much with this very valuable content. And again, just great feedback. Looking forward to getting that follow-up session on there. And gang, got uh, got about 120 of you hanging on the line here at about quarter past the hour. So I do appreciate that very much. And as I mentioned in the beginning, before my kids start to fight in the background, again working from home, that the session indeed was recorded, and we'll get that out to you probably tomorrow. I can't imagine it's going to go much past tomorrow. And if you have any questions, it's going to come directly from me. So go ahead and click reply. And uh, if it's directed towards Peter. Peter, I'll make sure I get those questions over to you and looking forward to getting that next session on the calendar in January. So, Peter, again, thank you so much. Another great session. Thank you. Thank you all for, for um, having me. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.